Hey guys, Jim here from Drink a Beer, Play a Game. It's October, it's the spooky season, so let's take a look at my horror game collection. Alright guys, so the first game up is going to be Friday the 13th, because it just makes sense for Halloween. And I don't like it. Yeah, um, it's a cool concept. You go around the camp trying to rescue all the camp goers from Jason. You have to fight Jason, blah, 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 blah. It just kind of doesn't work. It's really cryptic. Fighting Jason is a pain in the ass. And there's just not that much fun that I get from it. If you want to see like a real in-depth review, check the link below to Brian's full review that he did last year. But in the short amount of time that I've spent with this, I just really cannot get into it. The next game up's probably borderline counts, and I'm only putting it in here just because of the level design with the monsters, and that's going to be Abidox. Now, this game is a pain in the butt. It starts off with a pretty decent first level, and then when it gets to the vertical part, it becomes so freaking hard. Like, the jump in difficulty is insane in this game. And your hitbox is wonky. It's just not a great game in general, but I really think the boss designs are pretty cool. And, yeah, eh, it's cheap, so there's always that. I want to buy it. Alright, so let's move on to something a little different with Splatterhouse, One Paku Graffiti. So this here is a translated repro cart of the Famicom exclusive. So this was a cutesy, chibi spin-off of the Splatterhouse series. And you know what? It's fan friggin tastic Like, this actually plays so much smoother than I remember when we looked at it like six years ago. But... It's got a sense of humor about itself, it's got great control, it's got fun weapons, the combat's good, and it just, it's that perfect balance of fun, spooky, and not taking itself too seriously. This is one that should be in everyone's collection, play it no matter how you can get your hands on it. And if you want to know more about this game, check our old review in the link below. Alright, you know we had to get to this eventually, but let's hit up some Castlevania with the NES original. And, yeah, this one's an all-timer for a reason. Fantastic music, hard but not unfair gameplay. Yeah, you're gonna have to deal with the knockback and a lot of BS deaths until you know exactly what you're doing. Certainly not a cakewalk, but it does seem strangely fair in one of those games that you will get better at the more you play. It's not just straight BS difficulty. So, I always have a soft place in my heart for this because, yeah, I mean, it still aged pretty well, I think. Like, I didn't play Castlevania until I was in my 30s, and I still really like it. It's a series I've really gotten into. I haven't beaten it, but I still enjoy picking it up and popping it in. And since I took a look at the first Castlevania, it means, of course, I have to look at the second Castlevania, Simon's Quest. It's a good idea, but the execution really isn't there. And I've said this before with games like even the original Legend of Zelda. I hate games that are basically designed just to sell Nintendo Power, and without a walkthrough or Nintendo Power, how are you supposed to know anything that you're supposed to do in this? From the wonky translations to the cool ideas, like, it has a lot of cool ideas. It's vaguely the first metroidvania you could say but yeah in execution it's just too wonky it takes too much away like when i want castlevania i want my fast-paced platforming fun whether it's with the classic side scrolling or with the metroidvania this tried to do a little bit too much and it didn't really work out it's still better than people say though like just because avgn dunked on it doesn't mean it's that bad of a game
So, we looked at the first two, so we might as well finish off the trilogy with Castlevania III, Dracula's Curse. And the music is top-notch. The gameplay is about as refined as an 8-bit Castlevania is ever going to get. It looks great for the NES, and I don't even really like the NES color palette. You have branching paths. You just have so much to do in this, and it is brutally hard. Like, do you think the other Castlevanias are hard? Uh-uh. This one right here. This one will cause you some pain, so I've never even come close to finishing this one. I probably never will put the time into it, but it just remains one of those all-timers, especially for the Halloween season. All right, so the last game for the NES, I'm gonna... Uh, it's Ghost and Goblins. I love this series, but I hate, hate, hate this game. I really do. Like, the way I say Castlevania has its BS moments, but it doesn't feel like it's being unfair. This game is unfair. It's just not that good a game, I'm gonna say. Like, it's got, you know, the classic music. It's got... It's got fun weapons, but... Yeah, it's just too many BS deaths that you have to deal with unless you're, like, pinpoint or you spend hours and hours and hours of time trying to replay it to beat it. So, I mean, if you are ever been able to beat this all the way through, you are a much better gamer than I am, but I do not have the patience for it. Once again, check the link below for our full review of it. Alright, next up is going to be my only horror game on the Game Boy with Castlevania The Adventure, or THE Castlevania Adventure. Never really sure which way it's supposed to go, but ooh, this one's not really good. Uh, it's ridiculously slow. It's very limited as far as a Castlevania game goes because there's no sub-weapons, there's barely any kind of power-ups, and... It's like, there's four levels, which is good that it's so much short, but you're not going to breeze through it because some of the jumps and just the level design, such BS in this game. Like, there's just like such a level of not polish and finish that goes into this one, besides the clunkiness, and it's really just glitchy. Like, the graphics glitch out all the time in this game, so I don't know what the heck happened with this one. Only redeeming factor, super. Superb music in this game. Some of the best in the entire franchise, I have to say. But, yeah, outside of the music, not much to really talk up about here. And if you want to see more about this game, I did a Let's Play on it before. So, link will be below for that as well. Alright, we're moving on to some 16-bit Nintendo action with the Super NES and, well, really the Super Famicom, because it's way cheaper to collect that way. And first off, with Super Castlevania 4, or however the hell you say it in Japan, but yeah, it's widely regarded as one of the best games in the entire series. It, it really is the most accessible. Like, you have some of the best control, the 8-way movement with your whip is just such a breath of fresh air, the f soundtrack's pretty good. The control's great. It's got its moments of slowdown, but it's also got a lot of really cool effects that use Mode 7, especially for an earlier game on the Super NES. But, yeah, there really is just a lot to like here. And, I mean, once again, if you want to see the full review, we reviewed it before. Man, we've reviewed a lot of horror games on this channel. But, yeah, I mean, if you've never played Super 4, there's about a billion ways to go out there and find it. Find one of them, emulate it, I don't care. Just make sure you spend some time with it. <laughs> All right, and the last game I'm going to show is the one that's probably the most expensive if you own the North American version of it, but I don't because I'm not paying that much for it. 
but it's Castlevania Dracula X. So this is the port of Rondo of Blood that came out in the TurboGrafx CD. And, well, PC Engine CD, because it was Japan only. Aha. But either way. So this is a weird port that, like, takes a lot from that game. And, like, including control, attacks, some of the... Even some of the arranged music. Like, the music on this sounds really close to the CD quality arrangements that were on the PC Engine, which is insane to me. But, yeah, I mean, the music in here is fantastic. And it's really a bit of a step down and a shock from going from Super 4 to this. But just because it holds so many of those old school Castlevania tropes too much. Like you're back to the really stiff jumping. The one directional whipping. Like there's really not that much here that differentiates it from an NES game besides the superb graphics. And at least early on in the game it gives you some really cool use of Mode 7 in the backgrounds. But yeah, I still think it's a solid title. It's way harder than 4. But I would never recommend you spend the money for an actual North American cart. And even the Japanese cart started to go up because everyone caught on. Like, it's perfectly playable on a North American Super NES as long as you get rid of those little, you know, tabs in the middle of it. But, yeah, you don't need to be able to read to play it. But, my God, do you need to have some patience. But if you must own it, please just track down this version. Save yourself a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> So that'll do it for this video. As always, if you enjoyed, please hit that like button, leave a comment below, let me know what you think about my collection or what games I should definitely pick up that I'm missing. And if you like this video, make sure to check out my other videos where there's Brian's horror game collection, there's my 32X collection video, we have all kinds of stuff. And stay tuned next week as I take a look at my Sega Genesis horror games. Cheers, guys.